Okay, welcome. This is the uh, Micro One Lecture for uh, Tuesday, the uh, 8th of September. Um, so I'm going to try, I'm going to demo some features of the microprocessor in this, uh, in, in this program. And uh, it may well turn out that, um, that uh, you'll find this a little bit tedious at, in places. And if you do, uh, just try and bear in there and hang in there. Try and pay attention and, and kind of watch the details. I am going to use the magnifier and hopefully make it so you can read everything we're covering. I think it's okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, look at how we do a program, how we write a program for a micro. Now, obviously, before you can program a micro, you have to you have to you have to host it uh, in a, in a circuit where you provide power bypass capacitors. Uh, if you're providing an external clock, you have to provide that. If you're interfacing pins uh, to various signals, you have to provide that. If you're using some sort of output form, you have to connect all that. And yeah, you have to make sure you connect it appropriately with the appropriate voltages. Um, but we've done all that, uh, and your Viva board's kind of set up for all that already. Uh, so now we're ready to program. And we'll talk some more about some of the electrical parts as we go along. All right, so first off, let me shrink this down, and we'll bring up, here is, uh, here is uh, MP Lab X, and so it's all set to go, and uh, I have the code in here. Now, normally, at the beginning, you should, um, and uh, we can, yeah, we can get rid of this right here, because that's kind of superfluous. All right, so notice, um, I usually say uh, who, who the author is. We also talk about um, the, uh, um, it's just a blink routine and the date that you did it, August 31st. Uh, and then you always uh, paste in the configuration words and the uh, include file. And I suggest for, for, for purposes of, of uh, MPLAB uh, uh, assembly code, you go ahead and put in this list statement list and then you say p equals which stands for processor equals 16f1829 and then you put in r equals D dec for the radix as decimal and so it's just good to do this uh, so you can look at a glance and you know what processor you, you wrote this for and uh, it'll also cross check that and, and let you know if there's a problem um, the radix uh, means that if you don't indicate everything's a decimal and if you uh, want to do a uh, if you want to do a, um, a hexadecimal number, you type in 0x and then the, then the hex digits. Uh, if you want to do uh, a, a binary number, then usually you can do a b and put the digits. Now, <clears throat> this include file, I'm going to show you. Uh, I loaded it up, and uh, it's a little tricky to find this thing, uh, but um, <clears throat> I will show you if you need, if you really want to dig it up. But it's, it comes with uh, your version of MPLAB X, and every version of MPLAB X comes with a new a set of include files. Um, here's the include file, and uh, I'll go to the beginning, and uh, it talks, this was March 17th, 2019, so it's about a year old. Uh, <clears throat> they do update them, but this chip's been around for a while, so they haven't really had to mess with it. Uh, but sometimes they'll add some things. This just checks to make sure that, in fact, you are using a 16F1829, so you've got the right file. Otherwise, you should get an error. And then uh, uh, the uh, this WNF, uh, this is just uh, so that you can use uh, a W or an F instead of a 0 or a 1 when you use that, that one bit destination in the byte oriented instructions. And then here we go. Uh, and I think you can use upper and lowercase too, but uh, I guess it's probably best that these are capitals, obviously. Um, so here are the register files. Now, first off, they've listed these by bank. So here's bank zero, all the registers in bank zero. Here's bank one, all the registers in bank one, bank two. Notice that the core registers are only mentioned the very first time, and they go up to the intcon register. And then they're mapped to every bank. So whenever you reference in one of these core registers, you just use the zero bank designation, but it, it shows up in every bank, so you're fine. The the special function registers then are the next chunk here, all the way up to from uh, C to 1F, and then from 2-0 on, they're general purpose 
random access memory locations that you can use for anything. Um, that's bank zero, bank one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you can see after bank eight, there's really not much at all until bank 31, and then there's some some uh, some special stuff up here which we don't normally. These are shadow registers. There's a shadow status, shadow W register, shadow BSR, shadow P latch, and uh, shadow um, the uh, the indirect registers, uh, low and high for zero and low and high for one. Stack pointer, uh, and then the, I don't even know what the TOSL and TOSH are. Uh, but anyway, these these uh, these registers up here are registers that are used to hold the uh, uh, these values when you jump to an interrupt, and then when you jump back from an interrupt, the, the re these registers are restored from these shadow registers, and that makes the interrupt uh, a lot faster because this is all done in hardware. So that's very nice. Um, and, and, but you can actually get to them directly because they're in bank 31 if you actually needed to do that. Now you'd have to do that. Um, yeah, I guess you could do it through the BSR, I don't know, but normally you'd do it through an indirect register. And then here are the status bits. And um, okay, so anyway, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff after this. Uh, there are bits for the interrupt control register, port A, port B, port C. Uh, the peripheral interrupt registers one, two, three, and four, a uh, timer one control, timer one gate control, and so forth. Every module has it, its register, and pretty much what they do, they've they've defined all these things. So when you write your program, so for instance, uh, if we want to if we want to uh, if we want to uh, configure the processor clock, we have to write six. Actually, we have to write six eight into the OSCON register. You can also write 6A, doesn't matter. But, um, and we're gonna write that in the OSCON register. And we'll, we'll take a quick look at the data sheet so we can see what, where that comes from. So if we go to the data sheet right here, um, and we go to the, uh, the um, reference clock module, actually if we go to the end and back up, we'll get to it faster. And so here's the, um, let's see, OSCON registers coming up. Uh, that's clock uh, something. I don't know. Anyway, oh here we go. OSCON. So there's the OSCON register right there. Notice all these registers typically have eight bits because it's an eight-bit processor. And in this one, the seventh bit is the uh, the it's the software uh, phase lock loop enable. So, so you can turn the loop on and off of software if you did not enable it in your configuration word and we didn't we left it off so we could turn it on if we wanted to with software anytime we want to and and you can turn it off too um, here's the four bits to determine the frequency we've looked at this before for four megahertz we have one one zero one okay and and so so uh, in this register that would be one one zero one and then these last this bits unimplemented so we normally put a zero there even though it doesn't really matter and the last two bits then are down here. Zero, zero would mean your clock's determined by the uh, configuration word. And we put in there internal oscillator. So, um, so that's what we want to use, the internal oscillator. So you can just put zero, zero. If you, you could also put one, one or one, zero, and it would be totally equal. And so six A, six A, it doesn't really matter. So when, now if we write this out, we would have a zero here one one zero so that's going to be six and then one zero 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 or eight so that's 68 and again if you put one zero here that would be 6a and that would just be this selection here internal oscillator block so it would work there and it would also work here if we selected it in the configuration word what this allows you to do is even if you made a, an external selection in the configuration word you could shift it to the internal block if you wanted to by writing one x in there because it over it overrules the uh, configuration word, and and that gives you software control over your clock, which is nice. All right, and and we're going to have an internal clock of four megahertz. Now, um, since we selected the clock out, once we run it, I'll show you in the oscilloscope. The clock out pin is is actually F os divided by four, so it's not going to it's not going to be four megahertz coming out. It's going to be just uh, one megahertz because that's the actual instruction clock. Okay, and um, and I'm sure they give you the clock out. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Um, no, I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm pretty sure they do, though. Well, anyway, I'm not going to spend any more time on this. All right, so we'll put this down. Okay, so that's why we... That's why. So, again, the first thing we do is get the configuration words in place. The next thing we want to do is set up any, any random access variables we're going to use. Now, you don't have to give them names, but they're a whole lot easier to understand if you give them names. Uh, you know, like uh, student's age, student's grade, things like that. Uh, then, then they're much more meaningful. If you just said, like this is going to be in location 31 in bank 0, so you could just say 0x30, and this would be, well, sorry, 30 for that, and 31 for this one, and then uh, you could just say 0x31. You don't have to write delay. You could, you could write the number, but it's, um, it's harder to read your program. It's harder to make sense of what you're doing when you go back and look at your code a few weeks later or maybe a year or two later, and you can't remember what in the world you were doing. So you should always use variables with names that, mean, that are meaningful. These two values are going to be used in our little delay loop. We're going to use a, an 8-bit counter nested inside another 8-bit counter. And so what we're, what we're doing then is the internal counter counts, to two, to, counts from 255 down to 0, and then it decrements the outer loop from 255 to 254. Then it counts down again on the inner loop, and then it decrements the outer loop. So basically, we're going to count 256 counts, 255 to 0, 256 times, which is 256 times 256, which is uh, 64K. And so that'll give us just a little less than a second. If, if, if we slowed our processor clock down, uh, then we could, we, we, our counter could, be, uh, could count as a much smaller number and everything would be nice and happy. Now, one of the things I'm going to do uh, uh, we, when we debug this code, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delay, I, I'm going to take out these delays because you don't need them when you're in debug mode, really. Uh, but or maybe we'll just skip in, skip over. Them. But in any event, delays are really important in embedded controllers because a lot of times you're waiting on human input, or you're you're wanting humans to be able to see what you're showing them. And if you do it at uh, a million instructions per second, it may happen so fast that they don't see anything. And so, and I'll demonstrate that to you too in a minute. All right. So we use a compiler directive to do this, this C block and M block. And we just put the two variables in there. And we started at 30, so this is 30 and 31. We could have started at 20, because that's the first legal RAM location. And we could pick some other uh, bank and start there if we wanted. But, uh, but you have to remember, each bank, you have to skip those first 12 registers that are core registers. And then you have to skip the first, uh, the next, uh, from there all the way to 20, which could be special function registers. And then your RAM starts all the way up to about register tw uh, bank 12. And then after that, there's no more RAM because we only have 1K of RAM. All right. Uh, now, when uh, there's a couple of things to say, but I, I want to I wanna point this out. So when we, when we uh, I'm going to switch to uh, my little drawing thing. And I, I, this, hopefully this will be makes sense. Okay, I'm going to expand this, and I'm going to switch cameras. Okay, so let me set this aside for a minute, and I'm going to I'm going to write on draw on this, hopefully, and hopefully I can find my hand. yeah here okay. All right, so and here's my scope connection, and you can see it's all going screwy right now. All right. Well, anyway. Okay. So, so let's say this is this is our uh, this is our program memory space right here. There's the top of program memory, and the program memory runs all the way down here. Because in this family of chips, you could have up to 32k, and one of the chips I'm using for a project does have 32k. But our chip only has 8K. So we're going to draw a line here and say this is 8K. And our program memory starts at 0, and it goes to 8K. Now, uh, when you power up your computer, your microprocessor chip, it always starts execution where? where does it, how does it begin? 
it starts at location 0. If you cause an interrupt, the interrupt always jumps to location 4 to do the interrupt. So what we normally do, if we had an interrupt routine, we would put it in right here starting in location 4 and going down however many instructions we had. And then, but at location 0, uh, we want to put in a go to and we want to go to wherever, wherever our program begins and we label it start or you can call it something else and we'll say go to start and what happens then it puts the address in here of our first instruction that's here now if we don't have an interrupt service routine then we we can start you know five or six or whatever three whatever two I guess one but our first instruction has to be a go to our start and then we have to we should reserve location four in case we want to use interrupts at some point our next lab we are going to use interrupts so it's 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 somewhat relevant to keep that in mind and then um, and then our instructions go until we uh, use as many as we need and hopefully we don't have more than 8k because if we do we're out of luck because that's all the room we have remember this is program memory Okay, and every er, this the, every single word in this memory is 14, 14 bits. Every single word is fourteen bits. V I T S, fourteen bits. Whereas in our data memory, it's in thirty-two banks, uh, bank zero through thirty-one, and every location there is eight bits. Because this is a Harvard machine, we have different size data memory and program memory and it turns out that every instruction is 14 bits every single one which makes it sort of nice and but a little goofy too so anyway and let's see how this worked out and I'm gonna that. And, oh, wait, yeah that's all good okay okay now uh, we'll come back to this in a minute um, Okay, so let me change the camera back uh, to me, which maybe you don't really care about one way or the other, but that's okay. Now, so so now here's how this starts. We have this thing. Uh, it's up. It's also in our in our include file, uh, reset vector, and that's that's uh, that's where you go when you reset or power up, and then there you could put another thing in here called interrupt vector and code 0x0004 and then you could put your interrupt service routine starting there. We don't have one for this program so we're kind of not going to worry about it. Then here we have our main program and and we we call this main program code. These are all these are all a, 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 these are all assembly directives basically except for this go to start that's an instruction. Uh, and then we put our label here start. And what that does then that's where we're going to that's where our first instruction is going to go and uh, because we have this main program code we allow the linker to actually place the start of this code and it may it may place it after the interrupt service routine area so or i don't know it, it's going to stick it wherever it wants actually but um usually usually in the very first part of memory obviously okay now once we get all this set up we get our configuration word we get our variables we get our reset vector uh, set up to go to start at zero in the program memory. So that's where we'll begin executing. And the first thing it's going to do is do this jump, and it's going to take us to the start of our program. And if we had an interrupt service routine, we'd stick it in here. All right, now here's the start of our program. OK, now with our program, we have some other steps we, we're going to do. And we, we normally want to, these are pretty much things you always have to do. The first thing is, is we want to um, we want to set up the processor clock. So we're going to write we're going to we're going to we're going to put we need to get 68 written into the oscillator control register. Now, fortunately, the oscillator control register is one of those this abbreviate this this acrostic or whatever is is in uh, is in our uh, special is in our include file. If we pull our include file up and we scroll down, you can see it right here in bank one. 
OzCon, and it's actually location hex 0099. Uh, so that's where it is, and and that's how the, that's how the assembler knows where it is. Otherwise, it wouldn't know. But the include file tells it. So when we write in, uh, when we type in a name that's recognized in the include file, it turns light blue like this. And uh, when we type a compiler directive, it turns kind of a medium blue. And when we write a command like go to or move local to w or move w to f or whatever, it it turns dark blue. And when we write another variable that's uh, that's one we made up that's not in the include file, then it's going to be uh, light pink like this. Okay, and then a few other things come up light pink too, like reset vector and main program. I don't know why they do, but they do. And you can change those. You can configure that to be different colors if you want. That's something you can control. But it's nice that it color codes this because uh, if you're typing in a name and you think it's in the include file and it doesn't sh and it doesn't turn light blue, there's probably a problem, and you should check it out. All right. So we're going to come back and, and we're going to step through this code and see exactly how this executes. But for now, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the other parts. So first, we configure the processor clock, okay? And when we do that, it should be running at four megahertz. Uh, and our instruction clock then is that divided by four. It always is divided by four because it takes four clock ticks to execute each instruction. So we're so our instruction clock then will be one hertz, one megahertz, and that's what we'll see coming out of uh, the pin because uh, of setting that configuration word to send the clock out on one of the pins. And that pin's predetermined. It has to be RA4. So I have my oscilloscope plugged into RA4 and, and a common ground, and we'll see that in a second. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to configure uh, the, the ports. Now, this chip, and I've t said this before, this chip has three ports, port A, port B, and port C. Port A has... Uh, Theoretically, uh, f f uh, six different uh, pinouts. Uh, port uh, pin zero, pin A zero, A one, A two, A three, A four, and A five. A six and seven were not implemented. They don't exist on this port. Um, so it turns out that when we made our printed circuit board, we connected port A five to the green LED in the RGB LED, and we connected the common anode to uh, to uh, VDD, to power. So when we want to turn on the green LED, it's connected through a current limiting resistor to pin RA5. We have to set pin RA5 as an output, and we have to set it to ground so that the current can flow from the common anode through the green LED, through the current limiting resistor, and into pin RA5 where it goes to ground and completes the circuit. Now. Uh, that's how we set it up because our RGB LED had a common anode. If it had had a common cathode, then we would have had to hook that to ground and we would have had to power the pin to turn on uh, the LED. Uh, but as it is, we have to ground the pin or set the pin to zero to turn it on. Now, um, the first thing we have to do, we have three things we have to work with. We have to deal with the TRIS register, the analog select register, and then uh, the port register. Now, uh, the port register you only have to use if, in fact, you're going to preset a value. And, and we can also do that with, with the latch register. The lat register. Lat A, lat B, lat C. All these, the little X stands for A, B, or C. So these are the registers we have to mess with. Now, in, when we configure them, we must, we really do have to deal with the TRIS and the analog select. Now, by default, uh, there are 12 pins out of the 20 that are designated as analog pins. If you want to use those as digital inputs, you must turn off the analog function. The other eight pins, two of which are power and ground, one of which is the master clear, uh, but the other, so that really leaves that really leaves six pins counting the master clear. They don't have an analog function, so you really don't have to mess with the analog select bit if you didn't want to. But it's good programming practice to do that because you might port this code to another processor where there is an analog function on a pin that didn't have an analog function on the, the 16F1829. 
And so you, you just should, good programming practice, you just, just assume there, there, there is an analog function. It won't hurt to try and to, to change a bit that that's, doesn't exist. It won't cause any problems. Um, all right, so the tris bit stands for tri-state buffer. And what that does, that either turns on or off the pin, the pin's output. So if you want this pin to be an output, you must set the tris bit to a zero. And if you want this pin to be an input, you must set the tris bit to a one. So if you, you can remember this quite easily because output is an O, so that means you need to set the tris bit to a zero. And it, an input is an I, that looks like a one. So if you want it as an input, you must set the tris bit to an input. Now a lot of other processors switch that and they use ones for outputs and zeros for input. So don't assume that's always the case, but it is on this chip. And and the Ansel bits are all set, the all the ones that have, the 12 pins that have analog functions are all set as ones by default when the chip powers up. So if you don't want to use the analog function, you must change it to a digital. On the other hand, if you want to use the analog function, you must not change it to a digital function. Okay, so in our case, we have two, two pins we're going to be interested in for this program. RA5, because that's going to be, that's going to be uh, how we turn on and off the LED. And we're also going to use RB7, because that's going to be the pin that reads the push button. So we're going to use one input, the push button, and we're going to use one output, RA5. And they're pretty much already connected, but you do have to do one thing. There's a jumper on the little three pin header by the push button, and you need to move you need to move that jumper so that it's no longer set for the master clear function. You need to move it so it's set for the uh, RB7 function. And then you can use that push button as a push button input instead of resetting the whole chip. Now, sometimes we write these simple programs and you think it's working because you're resetting the whole chip but you're really resetting the chip. You're not, you're not, it's not reading the RB7. Uh, and as long as you hold the button down, uh, the chip's not, the, the light's gonna stop blinking. <laughs> so anyway, all right, so, uh, so we're gonna configure those two pins. So that's A and B. We're not even gonna mess with port C because we're not using it at all. So the first thing we're gonna do is bank cell the TRIS register, the data direction register for port A, and we're gonna clear bit five. So we bank cell, so the bank, so the BSR is pointing to the right bank, and then we use the instruction bit clear F. Tris A is our file register, that's the F, and then we have a three-bit uh, pin uh, identification, and that's five. So that controls the port RA5, which is which is needs to be an output. So we make it zero, we clear it. Then we select Tris B, and we set uh, the pin 7 to a 1 to make it an input. Now, by default, it is already a 1. So nothing will actually change when we execute this, but it's good practice just in case you wound up including this section of code in some other routine where you might have already messed with the with the pin 7 and cleared it or something. So this would just make it so that uh, you wouldn't forget to do this, but by default, it is already set that way. And uh, and the other thing is we don't really have to bank sell the TRIS B register because it's in the same bank as the A register. But again, it's good programming practice to do this. Uh, and then finally, uh, because we're using uh, this as an input, we do need to make sure that there's no an analog select bit set. So we, we since we're not using any other pins in, in, a, in port B, we're just going to clear the analog select register for port B so that all of it will be set for digital. Now it actually turns out that uh, that that pin 7 uh, of the analog select register for port B does not, uh, that pin does not have an analog function, so there is no bit in the an analog select register for it. So we don't really have to do this, but it doesn't hurt anything, and it's just good programming practice. Because there, there might be a chip where it did have an analog function, and if you didn't clear it, this input will not work. Now in our, pin, our, 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 our chip, it will work because there's no analog function, but it's still good programming practice to clear it anyway. All right, now the third thing we need to do, if we were using any specific modules, like timers, 
A to D converters or anything like that. Now we would set them up next. We would configure all their registers so that they were set to go and do exactly what we want them to do. And then finally, uh, the last thing we're going to, well, the next last thing we're going to do is write the main loop. Now I'm going to come back to that. Let me jump down here. The fifth thing we would do down here is I, is I would write any subroutine that are in the C, we call them functions, but in, in assembler we call them subroutines. And I would write any subroutines. Well, I do have a subroutine, and my subroutine is this little delay loop where it's a loop inside of a loop, and it counts effectively up to, two, uh, up to 65K. So this is how we get our delay. Now, we're not going to... I'm not going to mess with this. We're not going to really talk about this right now. I may come back later on and, and cover this in a later lecture. But for right now, just treat this like it's a, a turnkey operation. Uh, you know what? There's two end statements. but uh, So I guess we'll just get rid of this one. Okay, so now now we have... Uh, so that would be the last thing we do. Okay, but, but here, is the, here is our main loop right here. So we've configured everything. We have our subroutine written, and now this is our main loop. Now let's look at this. So the main loop is very straightforward. We're gonna, we're just gonna first we're gonna check to see if the push button is being pushed, and these instructions take care of that. takes takes uh, three instructions. First of all, the bank cell, which is a compiler directive, it's gonna generate the uh, the it's the MOVLB, the move literal to the BSR to point to the correct bank. And port B is in bank 1, I think, or maybe bank 0. Oh, it could be bank 0. Then anyway, I don't have to know that, though, because uh, because this is known by the configuration file. In fact, I can pull up the configuration file right here, my little include file, rather, and, uh, and I go to bank. Oh, yeah, so there's port B right there. So it is in bank. It is in bank 0. All right. But if I didn't know that, I don't have to know that. All I have to do is write bank cell, and it'll figure it out for me. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to issue an instruction called bit test f skip set. Now it's going to it's going to bit test port B because uh, because that is uh, that's where the in port B pin seven is where the push button is connected. It's got a pull up resistor on it. When you push the button, you short it to ground. When you let the button go, the pull-up resistor pulls it high. And it's a fairly, I think I put 100K on it, so it's a fairly high-value resistor. Uh, so that, that way you can use this pin for something else if you don't want to use the push button. But in any event, uh, so, so we're going to test port B, pin 7. And this, this is the 3-bit number that tells us what pin to, that we're going to deal with. In this case, it's a 7, so that's pin 7. And if it's if it's set, we're going to skip, which means we're going to skip the very next instruction. Well, what is the next instruction? The next instruction is go to blink loop. Well, here we had a we had a label up here. We called this whole we called our main loop blink loop, and we put a go to blink loop here. Now, if we didn't skip, then we'd just stay in this tight little loop here. We'd never go past this. But if in fact pin port B is high, if it's set, skip set, then we're going to skip. And that's what it will be if you're not pushing the button. If you are pushing the button, it will be zero it'll, or it'll be low. And you you won't you won't skip this and you'll be in this loop. So when you push the button, the uh, we will not be uh, turning, we will not be blinking the LED. It'll be left in the on position, actually, uh, unless you push it before you, before you even get started, in which case you'll never execute any of this code. All right, but let's say, for the sake of argument, we're not pushing the button, so it's going to be high, so we're going to skip set when we read it, and we're going to drop through, then we're going to do the bank cell, and we're going to bank cell the latch. Now, uh, we're going to look at each of these peripheral ports very carefully, and you're going to see how these pins are set up. And I'm and the port and the latch are very interesting. They're, they're sort of different functions, and you sort of have to know which one to use. But in general, you use the latch when you want to write to the port. You use the port when you want to read from the port. Now you can use the port to write, but you run a risk of having a really funny error that has to do with the read, modify, write 
aspects of the microprocessor. And this is this is true for almost all microprocessors. They mostly do do read, modify, writes. So I'll explain that later. But for now, just take it take it as a gospel that you should write using the latch, read using the port. If you read using the latch, all you'll read is whatever was written last. You won't if the port like a, like if it's port B7, you can still read the latch for port B7, but it has nothing to do with the input from the push button. If you want to see what the push button's doing, you must use the port command. On the other hand, we want to use the latch command when we're writing a value to the port to turn on and off our LED on, on latch A pin 5. We want, to, we want to use the latch for this because we're outputting either a 0 or a 1. We're either grounding the pin or we're raising it high. When we ground the pin, we turn on the LED. When we raise it high, we turn it off. Now, we're going to bank cell latch, so that's going to point us to the latch. And we don't know what bank the latch is in, but if we go up here and look, we can see. Uh, so bank 1, it's not there. Ah, so the latches are in bank 2. So the ports are in bank 0, latches are in bank bank 2. And the TRIS registers are in bank 1, I think. All right, and the ANSEL is in bank 4 or 5, I forget. All right, so anyway, <clears throat> so we're going to first set pin bit, uh, bit 5 in latch A, which will turn off the LED. Then we're going to call the time delay subroutine, which is going to give us about a second. And, and that way we can see, yes, we can see the, the LEDs off. Then we're going to select the latch again. Now, why would we do that? Why We just selected it up here. Why would we do it again? Well, when we called this uh, time delay routine, we, we, uh, we bank cell our variable delay. And it happens to be in bank 0, but the latch is in bank 2. So we would have changed the BSR to point to a different bank. And this instruction here would have actually not worked. Well, it would have, it might have worked because we would have been pointing to the port instead, assuming they're in the same location. I think they are, but that just would have been dumb luck. Uh, you really, you really do need to, to bank cell and make sure you're pointing to the right, to to the right location. Then we call time delay again. So here you clear the output. So now you turn on the LED because you made pin five go to ground, and that that provides a current path for the current to come from the common anode through the green LED to the current through the current limiting resistor and go to ground uh, when it comes in that pin five, RA5 of the micro. All right and so there you go uh, so that clears that and that turns it on and then we delay and then we do go to blink loop. We come up here and we do it all over again. Now notice I'll take these delays out. I'm going to run this and let you see it blinking, and then I'm going to uh, recompile it and take these delays out in a, in a few minutes. But right now, since I have it all set to go in um, in debug mode, and I'll walk you through that in a minute. But well, let me let me just walk you through that. Well, let, let me let me yeah let me let me walk through that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit this red square. Well, I'm, first I'm going to stop it. Then I'm going to hit the red square. Go out of debug mode. Now here's what you have to do to go into debug mode. You, you have to first compile it for debug main project. And you need to make sure it's lit up over here. Clean and build for debug main, main routine. OK. And you can see my, well, yeah, I didn't get any errors. Everything's good. Then you have to load for debug. Program device for debug. Now, normally you just hit the button. You're going to make and program for main project. You can also program for production. That means you, you're going to put this part out in the field. And if you have a, the right programmer, it'll exercise it a little more uh, and make sure that the program is really robust and it's going to, it's going to be OK. Uh, it it, tries, it does, does some different voltages and screws around with a little bit. And, and that's a production. But, it, but when you program for debug, it, it when you compile for debug and then program for debug, you put a you flash a little additional code in to handle the debug uh, part of the part of the uh, of the processor. Otherwise, you leave that out. Uh, okay, so we're going to program device for debug main project, and away we go. And it always gives us this little uh, this little 
Um, let's see. Oh, it's. Uh, okay, I guess it did it. Okay, and then um, now, now that's usually all you do, uh, and then your 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 parts running, but in this case, we uh, we have one more step to do, and that is we have to debug main project. And I'm going to move this over so you can. Oh, every time I do that, it goes away. Okay, well, whatever. Okay, and when it when this little thing at the bottom starts stops running, then we'll know we're done. And hopefully that's going to do the trick here. Oh man. Okay, I think it's screwed up. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, I can't. No, that's not what I wanted. All right, well, anyway, I guess that'll be okay. We'll just put that there. All right. Uh, and then, yeah, all right. And then, I don't know, special function registers. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so I think we're set to go. Now, if you look up here, there's a whole bunch of controls. Now, on some, on some uh, depends on how you have your taskbar set up sometimes they're not here and you have to hit a menu and scroll down if you shrink it down make it smaller then you have to find one of these memory uh, one of these uh, uh, pull down menus and there it is all right but we're going to leave it like this for now and uh, yeah we'll put me in there all right so now i'm going to go ahead i'm going to pause it like that then i'm going to hit the blue reset button and now we're ready to do a debug session there's a there's a setting you can set so when it automatically comes up in reset mode but i didn't i don't have that turned on all right so anyway notice we have this highlighted green light running through the middle of our uh the middle of our uh assembly listing and uh this tells us where what instruction would be executed next now uh this whole concept of, of being able to watch instructions execute one by one using debug tools is called source level debug which means we get a we get to see the source code and it and it tells us where in the source code we are and almost any uh, any integrated development environment worth its salt uh, has uh, has built in source source level debugging uh, so and this one does and it's uh, the, the debugger has some bugs, but it's uh, it's pretty good. It's not perfect. Um, okay, now we can step. So th so what I want you to see though is I want to go to the uh, the program memory, and uh, I don't know somehow it put it up here. I swear. Okay, we're gonna separate it out. Uh, I just keep getting it all, all sorts of play. Okay, I'll put it here in between. Uh, okay, I'm gonna put it over here, and then I'm gonna walk it back, and hopefully it won't. Uh, get screwed up. Now I'm going to make it a little bigger and then we're going to turn on the magnifier so you can see this. Okay, that's about right. Okay, and then we'll kind of do this. Okay, good. Now let me turn on the magnifier. Uh, let me actually, let me put it, yeah, let me put it up here. I, I don't want it to click in there though. Okay, I'll turn on the magnifier. Okay, so here's here's our this is our our program memory. So we we actually pull this we can pull this up by going to Windows um, and uh, uh, Memory Views, and then we can select Program Memory, and here it is. Th this this it this tells us um, okay. My mouse went away for a little bit. This tells us. Uh, where all our instructions have been have been put into memory and this this tells us and we can scroll through them and here's the end of our program right there after that there's no more program 
and they put in they put in all Fs because uh, when you uh, clear flash, that's that's what it defaults to. Uh, all the bits are turned on. And notice uh, there are 14 bits, right? Four, four, four. That's 12 plus two more bits. That's 14. So there. So three is the highest number that this first digit can be. It can be zero, one, two, or three. That's it. Um, so anyway, uh, this is this is what's stored. This is the address. So this is program memory zero, and what's stored there is hex two eight zero three. And what that translates into is a go to location three. Now we can we can. We can back out for just a second, and I can show you that that's the case. Uh, so let me do that, and then we'll come back to this. Oh. Okay, I'm going to show you that in the data sheet. And so here is the data sheet. We're going to go down to the instruction set. We looked at this the other day, chapter 29. And we're going to scroll down where we have these instructions listed out. And you can actually see now that was that was a go to instruction, right? Uh, so we go down here to the go to go to address, and so here's what it is. So it's so it's the 14 bits will be one zero one, and then kkkkk is the address. Well, our kkkkk address is just is just is just three. So these will all be zeros. So it's going to be one zero one. Zero 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 one one. That's what's going to be stored. And if you translate that, uh, that's that's going to be uh, that's going to be two eight two eight zero three twenty eight zero three. That's what we should see because that's that's what it takes. And you can you can you could compile your code by hand if you wanted and just type it at location zero twenty eight uh, two eight zero three. And then you could just keep typing the numbers in and figure out what all the codes should be. But it would be a real pain in the butt because it's a lot of work, a lot of numbers. And that's why we have an assembler to help us do that, uh, as it, provide all the help we can get without actually writing the code for us because it doesn't know what we want to do. All right, so we get rid of this, go back to here. So now I'm going to turn the magnifier back on. So if you go up here, look at 2803, that's what's there. And that translates, and they print it out here. This is the disassembly. Go to go to three. Now notice they don't use the label in the disassembly, because in the disassembly it doesn't know that location three has been named start. Well, actually, I guess it does, but it, it didn't put that information in there. Uh, so here's location one and two. For some reason, it put 34 in there. That was courtesy of the of the linker and the loader. Uh, if you had done this in absolute code and not relative code, then you could have specified what goes in there, but I guess we didn't really care. And so here's start. And interestingly enough, we're starting in location three, but the interrupt vector is location four. So we're just we're just ignoring that. We're, we're assuming that we're not going to ever turn on interrupts because if we do and get an interrupt, it's going to start in the middle of this code. Could be a problem. Okay, but anyway, uh, so the first thing we do here is at start. You notice we have an MOV LB instruction. Well, that's interesting because if you look at our code over here, uh, in our main program, our first instruction here is bank cell OSCON. That's really where start is. You kind of can only sort of see that. There's start, and you can see the instruction that comes right after start. That's actually in location three, where start is, is a bank cell OSCON. Notice that what happened is our assembler turned our bank cell OSCON instruction into MOVLB0X1. Now, what's going on there? Okay, remember, what does the bank cell do? It's, it points the BSR to the right bank. What bank was OSCON in? It's in bank one. It's not in zero, it's not in two, it's in bank one. So the assembler, on our behalf, just to help us out, looked up OSCON, saw it was in bank one, and then it created an MOVLB move literal to the BSR, and the literal that it's going to put there is a one. So that's going to load the BSR with one. Zero, it'll be the upper, remember there's only five bits that are active, so three bits are ignored, and then you have zero, 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 one. And that's going to point to bank one. 
And then the next instruction is uh, MOV LW, move literal to W, 68 hex. So when it executes this, uh, when we execute this, we're going to see 68 hex go into that location. Now here's the really cool thing. We can actually scroll down through this and, and watch these instructions actually execute. And, uh, and we can do that with this little down arrow right here. We can walk through this list and if I'm smart enough, I'll be able to pull up my other uh, thing if I can do that. Let's see. Yeah, let's try this. Yeah, they're the special function registers. Now, so I can scroll down. I should be able to scroll down through this list. Yeah, I could. Okay, good. So, so now uh, we want to go to bank one. Well, this is this is starting in bank zero. So we're going to have to scroll down to bank one, and we're looking for the OSCON register. And there it is, right there, OSCON. Notice right now it's got 38 in it. So watch what happens. We're gonna we're gonna step through here. First, first we're gonna we're gonna jump from here to location three. So we're right now at location zero. We're gonna go to location three where start is. Okay. So we hit this. Bang. We go to start. And it pulled back up my menu. And if you scroll down here, now I'm now I'm on that bank cell instruction. But I want to see the the registers. So I'm gonna bring this back up. And hopefully I'm yeah. There's Oscon. Now I'm gonna so now I'm gonna move one into the BSR. Uh, so let's go get the BSR. That's that's in the core registers which they put in here at the beginning. There's the BSR. Right now it's got zero in it. So watch what happens when we execute this instruction. Here we go. Boom. And bring this back up. Oh, I killed it. Damn. Uh, okay. Let's see if we can do this. So target memory views, target memory views, special function registers. And I don't know where it is. Uh, let's see. No, okay. Okay, I'm gonna have to, sorry. It's really sad. I'm gonna have to go out of this to make sense out of it. Oh, it pulled it up down here. Okay. I'm going to open this up and make it bigger. Okay, well. All right, there it is now. Okay, back into magnified view. And we'll go up here. Okay, now. Uh, where? So I have to scroll down to the OSCON again. It's in bank one. Uh... I don't think I'm there. Okay, something's wrong. Let's see. Okay, now let's go. There's a little bit of a lag, so it's easy to scroll past it. Ah, okay, there's OSCON. Okay, see OSCON, so it's got 38 in it, 56 decimal, 00111000 hex, and it translates into a uh, an ASCII 8. All right, so now I'm going to execute this instruction move oh, oh this is going to go into the W register so let me go back up to the W register there it is right there and so I'm going to do this and bang 68 in the W register now I can go down to OSCON and you can see our instruction over here we're going to move uh, Well, that's interesting. It says move, uh, move to timer one gate control. I hope it doesn't go to timer one gate control. Uh, let's see if it, what it does. There may. Have, I think it did move to timer one gate control. Oh my God! I'm, I'm, no, I don't know. But it didn't. Oh, there, yeah, there it is. It. I don't know why this says that. It, it. It. It got a. It had a brain problem. But anyway, you can see the OSCON does have 68 in it now. Hex. Okay, and that's our that's our 
zero one one zero one zero zero zero. So that's going to set us up for four megahertz. All right. Now that we're now that we're running at four megahertz, um, let's let's go ahead and look at our uh, our oscilloscope. And I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna I'm gonna run it. Uh, let's see where are we? Oh, let me go out of this. Okay, I'm just gonna run, let it run. Now it's running. Now uh, let me take the camera, and I'll go. There we are. I'm gonna blow this up. I guess I deleted it instead. Okay, uh, there's that. Let me switch cameras. So you can see it's it's blinking. Um, now I'm gonna do the camera. Okay, and I want to show you the oscilloscope. Okay. And let's see if I can put it up here. And if you look, I don't know if you can see this or not, but if you look, first of all, if you can see the we're running at 3.3 .3 volts, the peak to peak says 3.2. I don't know if you can do that or not. Yeah, you know, I think it's because it's just too bright. I don't know if it'll. I don't know if it's. Uh, yeah, you, you. What you? Sh I think what you can see there, if you look really carefully, and I'm. We're going up too much. You can see nine 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 point one zero three uh, kilohertz, which is very very close to one megahertz, and you can see three point two zero volts. So so that's the uh, and that's you can see if I'm looking at the chip, I just have my scope probe uh, connected to the uh, to the black wire. And I have the black wire plugged into the uh, RB4 port. And I have the other side just grounded so I get so I don't get too much distortion. You can see it's horrible now. But, so there's definitely noise around. Okay. All right. So there's that. Uh, I don't know. That was the... Uh, Unfortunately, the scope I bought is a hand is a is a hand tech, and hand tech is too cheap to pay Microsoft to get their drivers signed. Otherwise, uh, I could show it on my screen. Now, I you, there's a way to get around it, but um, it's a hassle, and uh, I had too many things loaded up. You have to you have to turn the computer off, reboot it. it takes forever, uh, or you have to change it permanently, and that's a little scary. So I haven't really done that yet. So anyway, it'd be nice if they just pay Microsoft. But Microsoft's such a jerk. They have secure boot, and they made it so that uh, if your driver's not signed, then you do secure boot, then you're done. Uh, and you can't see me at all. Okay, yeah. So anyway, um, so that's the deal. All right, now, I want to do a couple of other things. I, I, want, I want you to see a couple of other things here that hopefully will be interesting. Now, uh, one of the things I want to do is I want to show you that uh, that you can actually change values uh, in the computer. Now uh, I'll stop it and I'll reset it, and then we're going to step through it. So you see the uh, the code goes back up uh, to the very beginning to zero 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 because I reset it. And now if I if I if I single step through, uh, you can you can see this. Uh, and see, I don't know. I think I'm gonna, 
I think I'm going to kill this and open this view up again. I can't understand why it's got the wrong disassembled value there. Uh, or why it's making that mistake. That is crazy. Yeah, it says timer one gate control, but it, it clearly is not. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, yeah, I didn't want that. Hey, dang it. Okay, well, I guess we'll switch back and forth like this. All right, maybe this is a good way to do it. All right, so now I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to see if we can actually see these things change. So uh, I can switch back and forth here. All right, so I'm going to, so I'm going to step through. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to, so you can actually see, so now we're at start. Now we're going to put 68 into the W register, and then we're going to write it into OSCON. So again, since I reset everything, OSCON's down here. It's got 38 in again. That's its default. And then uh, when I, well, here, I'll just leave it here. So now when I single step it, uh, let's see, it should change. Oh, yeah, I, sorry, I have to do it one more time. There, now it changed it. It also changed the the oscillator status register, uh, which is interesting. Uh, okay, now uh, we're going to keep moving. Now I'm going to now I'm going to I'm going to bit clear f port a um, five, and uh, so we'll do that now. Uh, since I haven't set up uh, the So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna set uh, the tris register for yeah th I don't know why these all these uh, this disassembly is off it's giving us the wrong values it's it's taking everything as though it's in the in it, it, it as though it's in the uh, in the uh, in the bank zero so I guess that's what it does I don't know but before it was doing a little better but anyway because the actual instruction. It is uh, is bit set f tris b comma seven, but that's in bank. It's the same location, but it's in a different bank, and so it just defaults to the zero bank, I guess. Anyway, um, I haven't really played a lot with that. So it's it really how it's really smarter to to look at your actual uh, to actually look at the assembly listing down here, and then you then you see what what you really wrote, and here we are. We're bit set f tris b seven. Oh, okay. Now it now it did it. Lord Almighty. Uh, so I guess it talks if it can talk to the two. I don't know. This I. You can see the uh, the debug tools. They're they're a little they're a little squirrely, and the only way you're ever going to be able to use them in a crisis is use them when you don't have a crisis. Um, so, all right. So here we go. We'll just use this, even though some of it's going to be a little off. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, now we're going to step it again. So uh, let's let's first though look at Tris B seven. Uh, so we know Tris B is right here. So pin seven is that one right there. It's already a one, so it's not going to change. Okay, so no big deal. So we're not going to see anything anyway. All right, so we'll go ahead and step. Uh, now we're going to move three to the BSR. Uh, and so let's let's switch this over, and we'll switch to the BSR. That's back here on the first page, right there. There's the BSR. Currently has one in it. When we take this next step, it changes to three. Okay. There's always a little delay, and there's sometimes when you have to go a couple of instructions past the one you want to see in order to get it to change, uh, because there's a look, there can be lag in the debugger. Um, Again, not perfect. Um, all right, back to the program. Now we're going to clear Ansel B, so we'll just do that. Uh, what you can actually see uh, in the special function, the Ansels were in uh, in three, so we'll have to go out here a little bit to get to the Ansels. There are the Ansels right there. So there's Ansel A, B, and C, and notice uh, Ansel B. The only the upper four bits are used in this in this port, uh, seven, six, five, and four. 
Notice that 5 and 4 do have analog functions, and they're already set to a 1 by default. But the bits 7 and 6 don't have analog functions, and they are already zeros. So this is not going to do anything. Uh, I'm going to click it, but you won't see any red. Well, okay. Oh, sorry. We changed, uh, we changed 5 and 4, so it does show up red. But uh, we didn't change 7 because it was already 0. Okay, back to the program. Now we're gonna now we're gonna uh, we're gonna switch to bank zero, and we're gonna test port B that happens to be in bank zero, and pin seven. So we're gonna bit test F port B, skip set, pin seven. So we're gonna look at pin seven, and it's if it's set, we're gonna skip, and if it's not set, we won't skip. If we skip, then we're gonna skip this go to, and if we don't skip, we're gonna do the go to, and here it's back to zero C, uh, which uh, is here, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so let's uh, let's go to uh, let's go to port B, which is in page zero, and it's right there. There's port B. Notice what is pin seven? It is a one. We're going to test it, and since it's going to test as a one you're going to see that we're going to skip over the go to. So we're going to do the next instruction. Well, this, this just sets up uh, the BSR. Now we're going to test the bit. And if it's set, which we know it is, we're, we're going to skip over the go to and, and go to the, uh, the MOVLB2. So that sets us to bank 2. Now we're going to, uh, we're going to set the value in port A. Now, um, we're, this call is going to get us into trouble uh, because if we call the subroutine, we're going to we're going to have to. It's going to take a long time, so we don't really want to do that. So what we want to do is we want to skip over that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the cursor here, and then I'm going to go back up to debug, and I'm going to I'm going to run the cursor. So we'll skip that. We'll, we'll actually we did the delay, but now we're done with the delay. And now we're down here with bank cell lat A. And you can see uh, in our program memory, that's what we are. We're bank cell lat A. Lat A is in page 2, bank, a bank 2. So we're going to BSR, change the BSR to 2. And then we'll skip down here. And let's see. Now we're going to bit clear F port A5. Now, this is going to turn on the LED. So I'm going to, I'm going to see if there's some way on God's green earth well, okay, I'm going to just show you the picture. First, I'm going to have to get out of this. Uh, let's see, where is it? Here it is. Turn off the magnifier. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit uh, like this. And I'm going to bring in, I'm going to change this so it's so instead of me, it's looking at uh, the board. Okay, now you can see the board. And it's right here. And okay, now uh, I have to use this pull down menu, and I'm going to go down, and I'm just going to step one time, and watch what happens. The green light comes on. Now here's what's kind of cool. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to expand this back out a little bit. You can't see it, but I can. But I'm going to go into the special function registers, and I'm going to go into uh, to uh, latch, uh, I'm going to go into the latch A, the latch B, uh, latch A rather, and I'm going to change, and I'm going to type in, so they're all zeros, and I'm going to, I'm just going to make them all ones or something. Uh, z zero X um, F F. They won't all go to ones because some of the pins are being used to do the debugger and they're being controlled separately. And but anyway, but it should turn off the green LED. And you can see what latch A actually winds up with. Well, it it, it says it's all ones, but it it yeah, but it. Well, I guess it may be, but in any event, um, so that's what happens. Um, so, and if I change it, if I change it back to all zeros. Um, uh, zero X zero zero. I'll turn the LED back on, which is kind of cool. 
So you can actually use your integrated development environment to control individual pins coming out of this chip. Uh, and that's really helpful when you, uh, I mean, normally you do it under direct software control, but sometimes you're just super frustrated and you want to know what's going on and you, you just don't know. Now, here's the other thing. Let's supposing I go to the TRIS register up here. Uh, let's see, where was my TRIS register? Right here. So I'm just going to take TRIS A and I'm going to make them, okay, well, it looks like they are all inputs right now. Uh, that's interesting, but anyway, I'm going to make I'm going to type in uh, uh, 0x1f. Uh, Actually, no, because pin pin five is still an output. I'm going to do uh, ff. Make them all make them all inputs, and that should also turn off my LED. So here we go. Yep, and now it doesn't matter what I do down here on the latch. I can do whatever I want on the latch. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to turn on the LED because I turned off the tourist register. Now it turns out I could flash this LED by flashing by switching the bit in the tourist register just as easily as I could in the latch. And uh, if I turn the tourist register back on here uh, and make it um, what was it? It was uh, 1F, yeah, I think 1F, 0X1F. Uh, uh, so now it's back on. Now if I go down here and I change, or if I change the port up here, notice I can, I, so this is, now it's got a 1. Uh, yeah, it's got a 1, which is crazy because it's actually not a 1. But I can change, I can write, I can write, uh, I can write FF to this. So 0xff, and that should also turn off the LED because the port, the port will, the port A will write, it will write the output, it will read the input, but it it has a little Achilles heel problem on the output, and sometimes uh, you can screw it up, and I could do that by shorting it out, writing it, and you'd see that if I did that, it would it would it would read a zero even though there's supposed to be a uh, it would read a, I could make it read a one even though there's supposed to be a zero there uh, by, by pulling it high. But in any event, uh, okay, I think I'm sort of getting to the end of the line here. It's uh, it's been an hour twelve. Okay, so let me summarize what we did. Okay, I'm gonna shrink this and shrink all this. I had I had that other window guess hidden. I couldn't find it. Okay, and I'll switch this back to me. All right, so I know this was a little bit tedious, a lot of details, but hopefully you found it really interesting. And hopefully you see that, that uh, uh, well, let me, let me do one more thing uh, before I close. Uh, let's see, I'm going to shrink this back down. And I'm going to bring up the IDE again. And, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, and we'll make this make this big, and then I'm going to kill this one, and I'm going to kill this one, and now here's my code. I want to show you something. So I'm going to first off, I'm not going to I'm going to go out of debug mode. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hit the red square, and then I'm going to compile it again. And this time I'm just going to do a normal compile, but I'm going to change one little thing. I am going to comment out. I'm going to comment out the call. Now, uh, and I'm also I'll show you about the push button, but let me comment out the call. So I'm going to turn off the call here that delays after, delays when it's off. Okay, so I'm going to put a comment here. So now we're that now that's not going to happen. It's not going to, that, it's going to treat this as a comment, not an instruction. Okay, so let me, let me, uh, let me just uh, make sure we're doing the right thing. Clean and build main project. Okay, and then load it, and then uh, do that, and then I'm going to pull this up, and I'm going to switch the camera, so hopefully you can see it. Oh, man. Okay, I give up. 
Now, is the light blinking? No, it's not blinking. Well, okay, let's let's do this again. Let's instead of this, uh, in fact, maybe I can shrink this down a little bit. Maybe make it a, just a little bit bigger. Well, here, so I'll fix this. So I'll put this delay back in, and I'll put a delay here. I'll take this delay out. So now we're going to delay after we turn it off, but we're not going to delay after we turn it back on. And then, uh, okay, I'm going to have to do this so I can do it. So I'm, so I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and flash it again. You can use the run command too. It, it works just fine. Now, it's not. It's still programming. It's erasing, and um, it's done. Now it's running. See that little teeny flicker? So it's only on for just a few microseconds. And it does give you a little teeny flicker, but you, you don't really see it blinking. And, uh, and that's because it's on for such a short amount of time uh, that it, it, you really, you know, in a bright room, you really wouldn't, you know, if I, I, if I put on a light here, you know, you wouldn't even see anything. But uh, it's because it's really dark, you can see that little flicker. So, so th the point of this is to point out, so you, you have to have, bec this, this is part of learning about human interface. For the human to see this light, I mean, if I put the oscilloscope on it, you see it's, it's blinking. It's just blinking so fast, you can't see it. Now, what if I comment out both of these things? Uh, then what will we see? Well, that'll be interesting. Let's do it. And, uh, and then we'll expand that, and we'll program it, and then we'll shrink it back down. Oh, look. It looks like it's just on all the time. Now, this is, this is a classic error, and I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've done it, where I thought my program wasn't working because the light wasn't blinking, but in fact, it is blinking. It's just blinking so fast, you can't really see it. Now, I can prove that. I'll just, I'll just switch my scope. So I'm just going to switch this, and uh, I'm just going to switch my, my scope, and I'm going to switch it to the pin that's driving the LED, okay? Uh, what the heck, I did the wrong thing. Okay, so I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch the pin. So I have, I have this plugged into RA4, but I'm gonna plug it into RA5. And look, it's wailing away. So it is, it's, it's actually off more than it's on just by the because there's a couple of branches in the loop, and the branches happen to come when that when it's off. But it's blinking, but it's blinking, it's blinking at about a hundred and hundred and ten kilohertz. So it's blinking really fast, hundred you know hundred and ten thousand times a second. But it's clearly blinking, and it's mostly on. That's why it's pretty bright. If if the times were even, uh, if the times are even, then the brightness would be proportionately less. That's how pulse. That's how PWM works, and uh, this is actually PWMing it. It's just we're just not using a PWM module, um, and we probably have a little bit higher, too high of a rate. Uh, if we go back to our code, uh, if we go back to our code, if I put in some additional delays, so the so it's off. It's on more than it's off. So what I need is a couple of no ops in here. And if I do this, I'll probably get the proportions about the same. And so then let's just do this. And now we'll take a look at it. When it comes back on, right now it's not doing anything. Ah, yeah, now it's on about the same amount of time it's off. And notice it's, it's, it's a little, it's, a li it's not as bright as it was. It's a little dimmer because its duty cycle has changed. Now, before it had a duty cycle that was probably 75% of the time on, and now it's 50-50. And again, this is just brute force. This is what's called uh, bit banging PWM. Okay. Um,
I think that's enough excitement for one day. <laughs> so we'll quit with this. Uh, so I, I want you to, so what did we learn? We learned that, uh, that these instructions get translated into 14-bit values. Some, so, some of the information in that 14 bits tells the, tells the processor what the instruction is supposed to do. It's the opcode. Some of it tells it the location that's supposed to be affected. And then it, for some of the instructions, we have uh, three additional bits that tell it which bit to, uh, to test or which bit to change or set or clear. Uh, and then remember, we do have these other instructions where we have a single destination bit that tells us whether to leave the result in the file register or in the, or in the W register. Uh, notice we went through some steps. We first did the configuration words. We, uh, so, so we set up the configuration words. We made sure we included the include file. We set up our variables with some names for our delay loop, which we didn't really look at. We put a branch at the start of our memory so it would, when the reset vector kicked in, when we powered it up or reset it, that we would always jump to the beginning of our program. We didn't have an interrupt vector, so we didn't use that. And, uh, and then our bank select uh, created these MOVLB instructions that put in the, the, the right bank number into our BSR. And usually the banks, pretty much we're all we're pretty much stuck in bank zero one two maybe three and it's rare to use other banks uh, if we use certain modules we might get to some other banks but mostly we're and if we used all the memory we would we would use other banks but we're not going to do that probably until we get into C and then we set the first thing we did in our main program we s configured the processor clock and you saw it it was it was really within um, it was 999 point something kilohertz so it was very close it was within several hundred cycles of a meg so pretty accurate but but not not as accurate as a crystal uh, so if you really have to have a precise clock you have to do an external clock now you can actually tune this one up there's an Oz tune register that you can change the value in and you can adjust this so it's right on but as it heats up and cools and and different runs at different voltages it will it will move a little bit whereas a, a separate crystal clock uh, especially if you put it in a crystal oven with a feedback temperature sensor that keeps the oven temperature the same all the time, it will be very precise. And it will be more, more precise and less affected by temperature than the internal clock. But for most things, the internal clock's plenty good enough. Um, and then we, then we, the second thing we did, we configured our ports. In this case, we configured our TRIS and our ANCEL ports. We didn't actually have to configure the ANCEL, but we did have to make the TRIS an output. By default, the TRISs are inputs. So if you want them to be outputs, you do have to set them. And it's good practice to set the inputs too because you don't really know what might have changed up here. You know, somebody might modify this code later and, and screw up your TRIS bits. Uh, I see this all the time in student programs. So always make sure you do as much of your configuration in one location. Sometimes in a subroutine uh, or in a function call is not a bad idea. Uh, so that you know where to look to find problems. And then if you do change it anywhere else, make sure you put comments up at the top, you know, in, in, in underlined and everything, uh, maybe in red or something, so you know that you are going to mess with some of these, these settings uh, in your code. And sometimes that's necessary. Uh, and the next thing we would do uh, is the third thing, we would configure any modules. We didn't use any modules in this program, but we will be using modules in every other thing we do and you will have to configure these modules. And a lot of times we'll do that, we'll do that in an init routine, uh, init comms, init A to D. We'll, we'll write a little routine to do the initialization. Uh, and then, uh, and a lot of times we'll, we'll make sure that, that we don't, we, we only change the, the TRIS and the ANCEL settings that specifically apply to the module we're using and to no other module. So we'll be very careful not to we won't want to clear all the ANCEL bits. We'll just want to bit clear ones that we want to clear. R and C will use a mask to do that. We'll talk about that later. And then, then we had our main link, our main loop. And then we followed that with our one subroutine to give us that, that delay so we would actually see it blink instead of not being able to see it blink. All right, that's pretty much it. So uh, 
hopefully you didn't go too crazy and we went a little bit over. I apologize. I'll try and do a short one for Thursday.